such a great job to um, to uh, show the the contradiction um, of of the Cuban revolution and, and of Fidel Castro as a whole because you know on one hand you can't deny that he has been a great ally for African nations but on the other hand you still can't deny that the black people in Cuba are, are still struggling and race relations in Cuba as a whole you know, has a, has a long way to go. So, in trying to um, process this this contradiction, I wanted to ask: Would you say that um, the race struggle in Cuba is it a legacy of Fidel or is it a legacy of communism? Mm. And I, that could go to, to anyone, but I do want to hear what what you would say about that, sir. The, the legacy of racism in Cuba is predominantly the racism, the racist history of Cuba and slavery. That's the reality of it. But, as I told you, the coffee and cream culture in Latin America is still a factor. And yes, one of the contradictions of predominantly Eurocentric communists, Eurocentric socialists, is they don't deal with nationalism. So they believe the unity of the workers unite, workers come together, and it will solve all national contradictions. We know. In Krumer wrote a book called Consciencism, mm -hmm. or Consciousism, however you want to pronounce it, that dealt specifically with that you cannot have a revolution without the diagnostic replanting of the African culture mm. in our heads. Yeah. That's what so to have a revolution, but not dealing with, if you only deal with the class issue yeah. and, the, and the economic questions, but you don't deal with the, race. the psychological race issue, you're not dealing with the, the real issue. This is why we have so many failed struggles. Because even the ones who were took Marxist-Leninism as their ideology in, in Angola, the MPLA, Felimo, one of their contradictions was they didn't deal with race. And we look at the consequences of that. In Guinea-Bissau, Cabral had a very clear analysis of self, which gave a different analysis of the situation. The problem we have in MPLA and Felima, they don't really deal with race. Same with ANC. The problem with ANC is they don't deal with race. The problem with ANC. Right? <laughs> ANC have a, a, a deal with, well, there's contradictions about the economic, they haven't dealt with the economics either, but, but, but. They do the vote, they do the vote. The vote, the vote, the vote. Apart from redistributing wealth amongst a few brothers. Because of the But the point you're making is that I think it is a legacy, predominantly it's a historical legacy. Because the legacy of Cuba is that whites are in power like most of Latin America, even though they're not in the majority. So in Brazil, whites are in power. Whites dominate society, but, the, but it's an African-dominated country. But could you call it an African country? Yes, Africans are in the majority, but call it an African country when the whites are dominating? It's a, it's a, it's a contradiction. It's whites are in power. Yeah, so the contradiction is still there. And I do think there is, as you, you, you say, there is a contradiction in the analysis Fidel, when I, spoke, when I was in Cuba, I asked Africans all the time, what are you? Who are you? Cuban. They always say Cuban. Yeah. They don't say African. Because they don't deny the Africans, but they say Cuban first because the, the, the political context of Cuba was nationalism was around being Cuban. Not a, and they saw it as a contradiction and a divisive issue if people call themselves Africans, not Cubans. Uh, we would say, of course, incorrect analysis. But what else would your analysis be if you're coming from a Marxist-Leninist, yeah, uh, uh, Eurocentric view? And later on, as you, uh, Brother Bandaka uh, Van mentioned, that he later accepted that that was an error and that that's why they're trying to uh, address it. And even in their last Congress, they also had far more Africans in leadership positions a more senior position because they accept that the contradiction needs to be dealt with, has to be dealt with. And also institutions, you talked about the religious institutions, the cultural institutions, now they're being put back on, they're being put back and recognised by the state and supported now where they weren't before. So there's a recognition now that African culture is part of Cuban culture and it's worthy and it's important in society. 
and to practice African-based religions, as that wasn't the case before. So that's why I would accept that I think it's, a, it's mostly historical, but there's also that confusion analysis of Eurocentric socialists. Okay. Give thanks. We're going to now ask. I have one. Uh, okay, so um, if it's clear that he was more concerned about, you know, um, the Cubans as a whole, can we really say that it was a victory for Africans? Because clearly um, we can see that, you know, uh, America was trying to isolate them and they did need allies. So they did what they could to get the allies through helping African um, countries. But if the black people in his own country are still oppressed, does that really... It, it really makes me question his motive for even helping black people. It wasn't really to help, to help black people and the, the black struggle, but to help Cubans and to give them, to give them extra support. So, I mean... No, no. no, I say that that's a confused analysis there. It doesn't make any sense for Fidel Castro to have massive sanctions on their country and support all the people in the world that will give him more problems. That, that cannot be based on selfishness. It's, that's, not, that's not a logical argument, right? Why would Fidel Castro align himself with all the people in the world that imperialism hates as a way of helping his own people? If he really wanted to help his own people, you know, be selfish economically and so on, he would have tried to reach out to Israel, reach out to America, reach out, you know, give back the resources to, you know, he, that would what he would really need to do. So to say he did, he did the act of encouraging thousands of people to fight in Angola as some kind of way of helping Cuba, how did that help Cuba? It could only help Cuba in their status as humanitarians, but it made no, what was the benefit of thousands of Cubans giving their lives in Angola? The, the benefit was a humanitarian gesture to our people. That was what, and, and Fidel Castro always said, African blood runs through Cuban veins. We must support our brothers and sisters in Africa. And we've also said, who else did it? Where's the Africans doing it? Where are they doing it? And as I keep saying, we focus on the contradictions of racism in Cuba, but we conveniently, consistently avoid the support they gave to the African revolution in Africa. And what they did in, in, in Angola is no small thing. Because they had years and years and years of fighting against American imperialism in Angola, Zimbabwe, in uh, Mozambique, the frontline nations they call in South Africa and Namibia. And, it, and they all got their independence. Uh, as a result of that, that struggle, it really, you know, not real independence, what we would call it, because they're not revolutionaries, a lot of the people that took over, but in terms of their, the significant change, there's no doubt about it. Mandela release. And that whole transitional period was as a result of the defeat on the South African army because that was, the, that was the critical moment in the struggle. And therefore, to say that's not a victory for our people, that's a massive victory. We're not just talking about a few million Cubans, Africans in Cuba. We're talking about millions on the, on the continent who have moved forward and advanced as a result of the Cuban intervention. So, and if you look at it from our point of view, you can say all you like, we can give any opinion we want in here. Ask the Angolans what they think of Cuba. Ask the South Africans what they think of Cuba. Ask Namibia what they think of Cuba and Fidel Castro. They know the debt that they owe to Cuba. So, yes, it's not, no means perfect, but on proportionately, you give it so much weight to the racism in Cuba, not to the advancements that's been made. And I think it's, it's just disproportionate. Uh, and that's my point. It's not that it doesn't have contradictions, it's about what proportion you give to it. Oh. I'm a look seriously. Revolutionary greetings, brothers and sisters. Revolutionary greetings. Leave up there. Nice. I define myself just because I know a lot of people like to define me. <laughs> but as, I, as a self determining black person, I define myself. I'm a revolutionary pan Africanist. All right. Okay, so just get that straight All right. out of the way. was a victory for African people. Right. And I say this as Brother Asari made the point. You see, opinions, opinions can vary. And within our struggles, we need to struggle 
against philosophical idealism because it takes us nowhere. Facts don't change. Opinions may change, but the facts don't change. And so when we look at Cuba, I mean, an important question to ask is, why is imperialism so much against Cuba? That's a very important question. Because if we understand that question, then we will know the reason why they're against Cuba for so much is that it represents an alternative. It represents an alternative to the capitalist system. And it bothers them because as long as they stand, it gives people that hope and vision to bring about change. We talk about um, a victory. And brother leader says, and they, I do have a problem with cable and very often because it's, they take words and they give it this one dimensional view like, well, African dimensional view. You know, nice. no. Victory. I mean, I think they have the same kind of problems around struggle. Victory just simply means success. Okay? Can we not say that African people had a victory against slavery? Can we not say that African people had a victory against colonialism? Is African people totally free? No, they're not. But we can say that they had a victory. When we look at the Cuban situation, again, we, you know, we can't play around with facts. The chair and everybody here accepts that in healthcare, there's been advance. In employment, there's been advance. In education, we talk about the political structure. You know, we talk about literacy. We're talking about Cuba now, 80% literacy rate. We're talking about African people. We know if it's a victory because we can look at Cuba before the revolution and after the revolution. There's no kind of mystery about whether or not there's been a victory against all of these problems that our brothers and sisters are facing within the Caribbean and the world. Recently, just last year, we had a vote in the United Nations against sanctions. 190 countries voted in support of lifting the sanctions. Two countries abstained, America and Israel. It was, it was voted unanimously. Why do so many countries, every progressive movement, every, we supporting Cuba, why? Again, because they represent that example. And as Obama said, they tried to introduce, okay. they, they tried to introduce, I'm coming to an end. They tried to introduce sanctions to isolate Cuba, but in fact, in fact, the, the, the impact of the policy was to isolate America. I think as revolutionaries, we need to look at what did we learn from the Cuban revolution? Because I believe it gives us important lessons. The first lesson I think it gives us, if anybody, okay. if anybody I'm looks... Sorry. One minute. All right, all right. If anybody looks at the Kwanzaa principles, that is represented, nice. that is represented right, right. in the Cuban revolution. Yes, okay. Unity, self-determination, Collective work and responsibility. Okay, we know the quantum. Okay, system. right. Get it's represented. And I want to. So, mommy, no. listen up. Surely, mommy, listen up. Time I time must time. be going up to three. Sure. Fifty seconds. All right. I want to. I want to. I want to also say that. Well, I want to criticize. Well, I want to disagree with my brother Asari when he says that the Cuban Revolution does not recognize or acknowledge enough the question of nationalism. There is no country in which that you find representation of African culture as much, in particularly with the Yoruba culture, which is as strong as you see it in Cuba today. We accept that racism is there, but the only way to defeat racism is to defeat imperialism. And we've got to be absolutely clear on that. Okay, but there's no me. doubt it's going to be true. Give thanks. Can we now have um, Elder Pepper guy who raised his hand?
one time, I would love to be able to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. 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 I'm very curious by this discussion. And I have to salute the Kibura for putting it on. And I really admire my sister in the middle because I've learned quite a lot this evening. But the question is, is it a victory? What is a victory? None of us would argue about that fact. And the question of degree, but Dr. May said 50%, and Mrs. 75%. But are we looking for advance? Are we looking for victory? And victory is based on culture. Mm -hmm. and nobody can lend that to you. Mm -hmm. It has to be your base. Mm -hmm. yes. In Cuba, the language is Spanish. Mm -hmm. Everything is Spanish. Yeah. You are central. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody can give you freedom. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad we mentioned, <coughs> I think it was a family. You know, to go back down. Who raised a piece about Kabbalah? Kabbalah is only there on our terms. How do I have truth? On our terms. No truth. Mm -hmm. So, it's clear from where I stand, what I've heard. If a sorry, believe it or not. In farmers, we make good progress, no picture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Ten Amore, brothers and sisters, uh, giving thanks and praises. Just a couple of quick points. The first one, um, Brother Asari, the one of the questions that Brother Leader asked you was about I, I, I'm not too sure if you answered it and I may, and I may have missed it um, when Castro but I think you said it wasn't Castro it was Che Guevara that went mm -hmm. to America I think that's what you said Castro did go to America alright, let's hold in on this point when Castro went to America why didn't he initially call it a socialist revolution? I don't think you answered that. Yeah? So that's one question there, please. The second uh, point is, um, you mentioned about South Africa and the support given to Mandela, and you link that with victory. Question, is or was Mandela being free, a victory for African people in Azania. Mandela being free, being, was that a victory for African people in South Africa? I don't know what, in my humble opinion, my brother, and from the interactions that we've had with our brothers and sisters in Azania, that were no victory. But maybe you have another view on that. Also, um, just a quick thing in relation to what Brother Minka was saying about the 80% literacy and all those things you're supposed to get excited about. Okay, you have 80% literacy and you, call, and you can't even call yourself African. Well, sorry, I don't want any, any of that percentage of literacy right. if I can't even re recognize that I'm an African. That for me is global white supremacy telling you you're gonna hate yourself and call yourself Cuban, quote unquote, culturally Cuban rather than being African or all the things white. So culturally, those are my few quick points. Tatenda, give thanks and praises. Lovely interaction. Tatenda. Yeah, it's easy to answer. Easy to answer questions. Why did they call it socialism? Um, good tactic, in my opinion. One of the contradictions we have in the world today is how do you get to power and movements? And there's a um, one of the one of the things of critiques. I use um, Marxist-Leninism as a methodology, but not an ideology. 
So one of the one of the contradictions in Marxist Leninism is the analysis that revolution would come from the working class in capitalism. It's never happened anywhere. Right. Nowhere in the world has it happened. Every revolution in the world has right. come from the peasants and the, and, and the non-working class industrial people. It, it hasn't happened so far. I'm not saying it won't happen, but it hasn't happened. That analysis was incorrect. If you look at the, the Cuban revolution, it wasn't led by the Communist Party. It wasn't led by the Socialist Party. And if you look at a lot of the revolutions around the world, it hasn't been led by the Communist Party or the Socialist Party. If you look at Chavez, he wasn't a leader of the Socialist Party. He wasn't a leader of the Communist Party. He was a leader of a movement, and they later consolidated behind him in a mass movement. And we see this in many parts of Latin America. The revolutions have come from movements where the leadership, the cadre in the movements are socialist, but they don't openly say it. It's a tactic. Yeah, it's a tactic. I wish we could do more of it in the African <laughs> revolution, right? Have movements all over Africa, but they're really revolutionary, but they don't openly declare their position until they get power. Because we know imperialism, if you declare your position all over the world, they come after you straight away. So you have to be a bit tactical. Anyway. They come after you anyway, but yeah. what I'm saying is in the process of getting power, sometimes you have to be a bit tactical. I just think it was a tactical question. I'm not sure that Fidel even was ideologically that committed to socialism ideologically in the early stages. Maybe he wasn't. I think he was a pragmatist, but also a genuine person who moved towards a more progressive ideology as things happened. Malcolm X is the same. Malcolm X before he died, and Luther King before he died, was moving more and more towards a more progressive ideology because that was the honesty in them. So you don't think he was slightly, he felt slighted and decided to call it a social, socialist revolution? No, no, it was never going to be a capitalist revolution. It's not like, I mean, who in the world, you name any leader in the world that says, I could go down the capitalist path and get all the support from the capitalist world, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go a more difficult way and I'm going to go socialist where the whole world's against me. It made no sense. Because if Fidel Castro had denounced the Soviet Union, America would have put chuck money at him. We, we see leaders all around the world, all the African cronies we see around the world, puppets we see around the world, they denounce socialism and America comes with their aid and their trucks and whatever. So we see that. Now the other one, the support that Cuba gave to <laughs> South Africa wasn't to Mandela. It wasn't to the ANC. It was you to the... Mandela. No, I, I honed in on Mandela thanking Fidel Castro, but, I, but the, the struggle for the Cubans fought was for the South Africans as a whole. You said Not Mandela being free was a victory for... Yeah, it, was, it is a victory. There's no question about it. As, as Minker explained, stages of victory. There's no question that it's better for African people to have a independent elections in 94 than it was apartheid. I mean, how can we say that's not a victory? It's a victory. It's not, it's not what we want, the ultimate goal, but you cannot say, there's nobody in this room that would rather be under colonial rule or rather be a slave than be living in England now. No one in this room. And if you tell me that, you're bullshitting me. Nobody would rather that. So to move from one state to another is a victory. We move from victories. We move from... No, but victories are moving. That's what we call victory. I'm answering the question. The point on Mandela is irrelevant because, as I said, I wasn't giving... A, 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 the, the Cubans supported Angola. You've answered that one. The question of Mandela, we all know Mandela so, is not, a, wasn't, a, wasn't, a, wasn't a socialist. He wrote a book before he went into prison. And in his book, before he went into prison, he said, I'm not a socialist. He supported the Freedom Charter, which we all know is an equal opportunities paper, <laughs> right? Yeah. That said that the land belongs to those who live there. Tactics. We can never agree with that. We agree with the Africanists who oh. say the land belongs to the Africans. It's not tactical. Yeah. So we never agree. No, it wasn't tactical. He didn't tactically say the land belonged to the people. He believed that. Yeah. We Cheers. disagree with him. Cheers. So we never, we, we, we never supported uh, that position. With all the love and respect <laughs> for God's honor, sorry. I think that was such an erroneous um, yeah. point that he made just now. Uh, we, uh, which is comparing the 
the South African Azanian situation with Cuba. In Azania, you had a process that was led by African people. You had African people fighting for their land back, fighting for their land, fighting for their liberation from a oppressive white regime. That was not what happened in Cuba. In Cuba, you had a white, a group of white re uh, rebels taking over the levers of government, and there's a school of thought in you know, There's a school of thought in you know, that the CIA was backing Castro's revolution because the CIA was fed up with Batista, who had become an embarrassment to the CIA. There is that school of thought, right? Another erroneous, uh, and, and, and we've totally, totally left out the fact that there were African nations like Zimbabwe, like Mozambique, and other African nations. African nations like uh, even Ghana, Tanzania, who were supporting the liberation of our people in South Africa. We totally ignored that yeah. for the sake of elevating um, Castro and Cuba. Yeah, the Another erroneous point that um, our brother makes is in relation to Nelson Mandela and Nelson Mandela lauding and applauding um, Fidel Castro and at the same time castigating Robert Mugabe for being in power for being in power too long yeah. when Fidel Castro was in power twice as long mm. can you see the contradiction brothers and sisters Love white people. Yeah? yeah so when it's a white uh, anti-imperialist as, as, as they call it it's okay but if an African if an African has taken through, through shedding their own blood has reclaimed the levers of power of their own nation you must surrender it to agents of imperialism yeah, to prove because it. that's that's what you're doing when you are when you when you're forcing a government. That's right. I, I don't know if this is my point. Yeah, I think it's so erroneous. There are one or two other points I want to respond to. Ten Yeah, very interesting um, debate. Um, firstly, I want to thank the panel for their contributions today, and also. You know, especially Uncle Asari, because growing up in this, in, 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 in the conscious community, I've seen so many elders just come and go. Yeah. And then Uncle Asari yeah. has been a fixture <laughs> of the community for my younger. I can't remember. And I think he has to be applauded yeah. um, for that. I really love now, up, I'm a child of the Akim this movement, so my uh, political leanings are going to be completely opposed to. Uh, my uncle is sorry who I've just loaded um, slightly on this issue, you know. But um, me, my personal view, from a young person's point of view, there's too much intellectual analysis and semantics. With all due respect, Uncle Minka, a victory is self-explanatory to me. It's a victory. And I use an example, I like to use examples from my peers because it helps them to understand. When you say Bolt won the 100 meter race, I uh, think, who is it, Tyson Gay? Or was it? No, Gatlin came second and run the fastest time he's ever run for the year. But he came second. That's not a victory for him. It's the best time he's run is progress. It's his personal best, season's best. But it's not a victory. The victory was that you say Bolt won the race and got the gold medal. That's right. the end all of it. The victory is the end goal. It's not the progress, it's not the training, it's not the season's best. The victory is the end goal. And if the ultimate end goal hasn't been reached, then a victory hasn't been reached, in my opinion. Um, we speak of certain African countries and ask um, Nigeria about Castro, ask Angola about Castro, ask Grenada about, or ask Grenada about Obama, ask Angola about Obama, ask Nigeria about Obama. We're all going to say Obama's great stuff, but we know the truth about Obama. My thing is this that as African people, as conscious as we believe, and as much progress as we think we've made, we actually have made none, because we have a sickness that's called whiteness, that affects us in so many different ways, and the, 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 the sickness of whiteness, I think my, my, my dad um, alluded to it just now, where we lord people like 
Castro and, and, and Che Guevara. And it's growing up in this community, I've seen Garvey be criticized. I've seen Malcolm be criticized. I've seen um, you know, various of our leaders be criticized for their political um, or their lack of understanding in different fields. But there's two people who when they criticize, there is serious backlash yeah. and that is Castro and that is Shay. And I don't understand how these two white men are so relevant. And I think one thing we need to do, if we're gonna take an example from white people, there's one example from white people that we need to take is this, that when white people take something from somebody else, they take what they take and they don't call nobody's name. They talk, we talk about, um, what's his name? Uh, is it Ho Chi Minh? Who was, uh, and, and Candy, and various devils that, that uh, Mao Zedong, and all these devils that, that, that was, uh, um, that was, that, the convention. convention, but uh, Papa Garvey. And not one of these devils called um, Papa Garvey's name. No, no. Not one of these devils, all now, go to China, go anywhere now, nobody's calling Papa Garvey's name. But they're all using Papa Garvey's race first philosophy yeah. to aid their people. So I believe if Castro did some good things, okay, we take the good things, but we let the devil rest. <laughs> That's my opinion. Let the devil sleep. Yeah. Let's take the good things. Yeah. Let's take what he did, okay, I mean, 80% literacy rate. There's almost 80% literacy rate of 98%. Well, let's call, let's say there's 98% literacy rate of African people in the UK. Are we seeing African people in the UK progress? Is that a good thing? Are the more African people going to university in the UK? Is that a good thing? Right now, yeah. university is doing yeah. more damage to African people. I'm in university now, and the damage that's being done, most African people are being politicized in university. Right now, university, you can't even speak of race. Because if you speak of race, you're, you're, it, it, it's problematic. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to speak of race, what you have to first do is speak of LBGT, EFG, HIJK, LMNP. And once you do that, uh, you can mention race a little bit, but don't get too deep into race. You have to deal with that side. And it's a frustration for you because as African people, we need to understand that Africanness and our African being, seeing our African face, the color of Africa, the color of black is important. And we lord a white man over all our African leaders, all the great things that that China did, Paul Bobo, Papa Garvey, uh, Thomas Sankara, and we hail up uh, Castro over all these people. To me, if we're talking progress, and this is the conscious community, how do we expect our brothers and sisters out there to make any progress when this is what we're talking about in the conscious community? To me, it's foolish. Thank you. Whether you like it or not, there's a struggle going on in the world today against those that are oppressed and the oppressor. All right? There's a struggle going on. And it's quite interesting that when <coughs> Fidel Castro died, Ronald Trump went on his Twitter. Ronald. Donald. 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 Demonstrating and celebrating. Mm -hmm. Mostly white. Mostly white. So what we're dealing with is really ideas at this moment in time. It's not really about color. And if we really want to understand what Garvey represented, Garvey represented freedom and independence. He represented anti-colonialism. Whether we like it or not, whether we like it or not, it did, those ideas did not start with Garvey. So therefore, when anybody comes, so when people come to Garvey, when people come to Garvey and draw those and draw those ideas from him, it's just like Garvey drew ideas from people that came before him, such as what we saw within the Asian Revolution. And so, and, and, and so, we've just got to be absolutely clear that because because when we talk about Black. Victory, we must put it in its context. Africa. South Africa was not, you know, many people weren't out there supporting the resistance in South Africa. But let me just tell you this 1986, the Battle of Kinko <coughs> Pranavala. That battle there was the turning point 
in that struggle in what we call a victory against apartheid. Now you may not like it because you want to say it wasn't there. But it represented a victory against apartheid. And so coming back to the issue of Cuba, what we can learn from it. What we can learn from Cuba, whether we like it or not, there's hardly any example on this planet in which that you see a country which is standing up representing the interests of its people. And those, anybody who is struggling for freedom and independence should be able to think we can learn something from that. And one of the things, as I said, that what we can learn, and one of the reasons why that country cannot be defeated is the way in which the Cuban Revolution actually dealt with the contradictions within its society. For example, I know it's a communist party, it opened up its doors to all religious people. Opened up its doors. In every street corner you have what they call committee for the revolution. We need to get out there amongst the people. And so therefore, we, as we come here today, it's not about putting down Castro. It's not about putting down the Cuban revolution. It should be really what we can learn from it. And as I said it before, I'm say it again. We need to be careful whose bed we end up in. Because a lot of the talk I hear is the same kind of talk I hear coming out of Donald, run out Donald Trump. All right? We need to be clear where we are. There's a struggle going on, and we should be clear what side we are on. And I'm very clear about that, that the Cuban revolution represented an advance for us. And we must stop the talking, look at the people, carry out a successful revolution, and see what we can learn from it. Because we need to organize a revolution here. And just my last point. My last point is this. There ain't going to be no individual. People must be joking. There ain't going to be no individual revolution. Okay? For what I know a lot of you may think, oh, we're going to have a revolution. There's going to be no individual revolution. There's going to be an African, as Kwame Nkrumah talks about, an African revolution in which that what we support each other to bring about that mighty power. Because whether we like it or not, imperialism is going to make sure it destroys any opposition to it that comes up in the form of self-determination. So this, I, this idealism about, well, that is not victory. Taking control of your own economy represents a victory. If it's a total victory, no. It's only going to be a total victory when imperialism is defeated. And it's not just going to be from African people because there's other people on this planet who's got their own interest in defeating imperialism as well. And if we don't wake up to that reality, then we're really living in cloud cuckoo land. Nice, nice brother. Nice. <laughs> when I heard the definition of victory being given, it didn't sit well with me. It was really unsettling. So I thought I'd have a look on our wonderful internet and just see the definition of the word victory. Um, and according to Oxford, Oxford Dictionary, it says an act of defeating an enemy or opponent in a battle game or other competition. There's no mention of the word success. No, no mention of it at all. And, you know, it, it makes me think of all the different wars that our ancestors have actually won, you know, top, whether it's all of our different leaders, whether it's, you know, um, Yara Santiwa, and all the different wars that we know going through history. And I'm sure our brothers and sisters and our ancestors that have been through that process, they're not talking about success. They're talking about survival. They're talking about African resentment. They're talking about us rising up. It's not about success. It's about what are we trying to build for our future. And, you know, if we imagine that we're, we're, we're grooming our children, we're developing them, and the, the only word that we can find is success? It, that, no, sorry, there's not enough strength and empowerment. Surely we, ha we, we have to be striving for so much better. So, yeah, that's really just what I really just wanted to share. Tenda Mwari, thank you for watching this video. We do hope you found it edifying and purposeful. Please feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit us at our website, alkebulan.org. Tenda Mwari.